this is going to be a pretty informal presentation. So if you got questions or whatever, you know, feel free to um, feel free to pop up and ask them. I don't know how, but perhaps you can move closer. <laughs> Um, I'll try to speak louder, and um, you know you're welcome to move up closer. <laughs> um, now I know some of you are D programmers because you know, like Adam and Brad. Um, who else are D programmers here? Wow, do I know you? Yeah. I mean, are you on the like the D forums and stuff like that? I, I haven't spent a lot of time recently, so I, like, I have to come back and do it after about two years. Okay, cool. Um, so how many of you heard of the D programming language? Okay, how many of you written a program in it? Like Hello World or something more complicated? Yeah, that's, I get a higher percentage every time. <laughs> okay, so this talk is going to be about uh, component programming in the D programming language. Um, hopefully have some fun with this. There we go. Let's. How many people believe in writing reusable software? <laughs> like, like the Easter Bunny. <laughs> Very good comment. You know, it's kind of an axiom. I've been uh, programming for 30 or 40 years, and it's always reusable software. Everybody buys into it. Everybody likes the idea. Everyone, you know, it's an axiom. We all kind of take it for granted. Um, and we all try to write reusable software, and oftentimes we, we think we are actually writing reusable software. Who thinks they write reusable software? <laughs> eh, I see the little hand wiggling. Well, I, I, hopefully I can, I can help out with that. Okay, the reality is I've been writing software for 35 years and almost none of it's reusable even though I wrote reusable software. It's not reusable. You know, this is, this is kind of maddening to me. What, what am I doing wrong? And no, I don't count copying and pasting code as writing reusable software. You know, that's... Yeah, copy pasta. That's not reusable software. <laughs> um, that's... Uh, I do that a lot, you know. I'll, you know, I got this text macro processor over here and I need it in another program so I copy it and I edit it up and re-engineer the whole thing and get it in a new one. And then a couple years later I'm running something else that needs a text macro processor and I do the whole process over again. So, you know, I'm doing something terribly wrong somewhere. And how many of you get that feeling that you're really doing something wrong because none of your software is reusable? Well, I sure do. So, it ain't for lack of trying. Every time I try to write reusable software, I go, you know, darn it, this time I'm going to make it work. And it's not because I'm a better programmer than I used to be, even though I, I think I am. Um, so that I'm one of those people who can't stand sometimes my own stuff and I got to rewrite it just because, you know, there's the latest fashion and I want to write it in the latest fashion. So, you know, I need to look deeper as what's going horribly wrong with my code. So the first thing, when I look at it, I notice that my abstractions are leaky. Um, the, de the dependencies start to, you know, like you put two liquids together, they start to merge. <laughs> well, whenever I build a piece of reusable software, I always start hash including or importing other modules and other things and things just kind of start going like that. Um, another problem is things are too specific. They work for type T and they don't work for type U, so I got to redo them. Um, so I need another approach. So. Back to the main topic here is, you know, what's a component? Everybody thinks they know what a component is. If you Google it, you'll find all kinds of um, ideas about what a component is. Um, 
I think it's more than just reusable software. There's lots and lots of libraries out there with reusable code, and we all use those libraries, but I wouldn't really call them components because a component follows a predefined interface. A predefined interface means that people can independently code to that interface and then interchange things, okay? So if I have a sort with an interface that's a standard interface, I can pick a sort from company A or company B that conform to that interface and reuse them. That would, that would make that sort a component. And the problem with most libraries, particularly like C libraries, is every one of them rolls their own interface. So if you're using multiple libraries, you wind up building a lot of scaffolding to connect the libraries together. Who does that? Yeah. It's like that. Until recently, every C++ library invented their own string type. So when you use two libraries from two different vendors, you've got to write some sort of conversion between the string types. And, you know, that's not really component programming. So you want to drill down to what is, what is the most basic thing that computing does? And think about a component that way. It's a basic thing. It's a, something that reads input, does something with the data, and writes output. So let's kind of, kind of see, you know, pull on that string and see where, where that goes. And of course, not all programs do that. Some of them are like GUI interfaces don't really fit that model, but they have subsystems in them that do. So in pseudocode, we can call it a source, algorithm, and a sync. Data comes from the source, gets ground up in the algorithm, and, and gets put into the sync. Or we can do composition. We can go from source to one algorithm to the next algorithm, et cetera, et cetera, and then off to the sink. Does anybody think that's a reasonable component that can do that? So let's look back at a typical piece of code I write. Um, I'm getting some arguments in as a string, and my first string is a pattern. While I'm not at the end of file, I read a line from standard in. If it matches my pattern, I write to the output. And, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable piece of code. But it doesn't look like source algorithm sync, does it? <laughs> Who writes code like this? I look at my code, it's all a bunch of loops like that. And what do loops look like? It's what <laughs> what I call a whirlpool style programming because what happens is your code enters the top and it starts going around and around and around that loop and then it disappears out the center of the loop okay you know just like the maelstrom or you know the water going down the drain in your bathtub it whirls around and finally drops out in the center of your function it kind of goes goes to the output that doesn't look very amenable to breaking it up into components because, you know, components, you want to draw a nice little box around here and, you know, what are you going to draw the box around? It, it doesn't work. What we'd like to see is the way we actually think about problems. I want my standard in. I want to convert it to lines. I want to match to a pattern and write to standard out. Now, the funny thing is, is you think about this, but I've been programming so long, oops, I always wind up thinking like this. There's something, something unnatural about this, but it has become natural because I did it all the time. And we have an analog in the manufacturing industry, which is the assembly line. Parts come in the one end of the factory and they move along. And at each station, something happens to it. And at the other end of the factory, an airplane comes out, or a car, or a dishwasher, or something like that. Well-known way to do things. 
Why shouldn't that work with software? And it actually does work with software because we've all seen this before. The Unix files and filters command, incredibly successful. It's what makes Unix so successful. Everything is broken down into files that, you know, input comes from files and the output goes to files and then you have programs that read files and write files in the center. Um, functional languages like Haskell, I keep wanting to call it Haskell, <laughs> but it is Haskell, uh, do the same thing and imperative languages like C Sharp's Link have a sort of uh, assembly line component model like this. The files and filters model, um, the files happen to be both the sources and the sinks, algorithms and filters, you know about pipes that connect them and it is so successful that on Linux you'll even see pseudo file systems. You know, things that, here's a reference to some of them, things that aren't even files but they present a file-like interface so they can be hooked in with these algorithms. Um, here's a little demonstration in Haskell, reads from the standard in, breaks up into lines, sorts the lines, writes the result to standard out, written by a friend and colleague, uh, Bartosz Maluski. And you know, it's pretty simple. The only oddity about that is, you know, the Haskell people insist things ought to go from uh, right to left. So. It took me a while to figure out what was, what was bugging me about it, and that is it, it reads backwards. Mm -hmm. um, C Sharp's uh, link system. Looks a lot like this. Um, we're going, iterating over the numbers, we're picking the numbers that are less than five, and we're picking those, and here we're writing them out. And this example is from one of Microsoft's tutorials on how to use Link. So this would be the pipeline here. So we want to get this to work in D. We have uh, sources. Sources of data can be uh, streams, which it will include files. Um, it can be containers, like a tree or a link list or an array, those are containers. Or it can be generators. Who's got an example of a generator? Yes, sir. A uh, process that produces output without consuming any input. Yes, that's what a generator is, an example. A random, random number generator. Random number generator, perfect example. It's always, you know, gives you data whenever you want it. It's always, always there to give you more data. The classic algorithms are filter, map, reduce, and sort. Of course, they're more, but you know, these are the classics. Sinks. Sinks are things that you write data to, and uh, generally you write things to streams, which again are like files, or you can write them to containers. So here are some examples of sources, algorithms, and sinks. And the idea is, just like when you're generating a new name for your startup, you pick one from the first column, one from the second column, and one from the third column. And by picking them at random, you have a new name for your startup. <laughs> Except that with programming, this should actually work. I should be able to take, let's say, an array, run it through odd, and write the output to a tree. And that should work. Or any other route through here. Or I should be able to take a socket, go to sort, reduce, search, and then write the output to an array. So if I'm successful in doing that, then I have components because my components can take this and this and this and just snap them together and it should work. If it doesn't work, it's not a component and there's a failure somewhere along the line. So let's sum up our requirements for what a component is. They snap together, or another word for that is they're composable. Uh, strong encapsulation support, because we don't like leaky abstractions. We want to generate industrial quality code, because if we don't generate industrial quality code, people won't use it. They'll go back to writing their Whirlpool code because it's more efficient. It's got to deliver on the efficiency. 
It's got to have a natural looking left to right syntax and it's got to work with types not known in advance. So it's got to work with pretty much unknown types. So let's start with sources and we'll just call them input ranges because we didn't think of the term source at the time. So we call them input ranges and what's the minimum requirements we need for an input range? Is there data available? Yes, sir. Input ranges need to be composable? Because you won't always just have one sink. Or sorry, one source. Like, suppose you're doing GUIs. You said some systems may follow this pattern. If you want to be general, there needs to be ways to combine input ranges into one input range. Yes, and there are, there are several ways to do that. Um, you can have an input range have as its output and look like another input range. Or there are ways to like zip two ranges together so that into a third range so that it's taking output from one. When it's exhausted, it takes output from the next one. And there are various ways to compose them like that. Yeah, I, I thought you were asking for requirements for input range, so I wanted to put that out there as a requirement. Okay, good idea. So we really only need three things out of input. We need to know if there's, if there's data in it. And we need to be able to get the current piece of data. And we need to advance to the next one. Now C Sharp does it a different way. They do it with two things where they combine two of these into one. This is a slightly different way of doing it. They're all broken out into three distinct things. And the interesting thing about input range in D is it's not a type. It's not an interface that you derive from. It's not, it's not something you inherit from. All it needs are those three primitives with these three names. So I guess you'd call that duct typing. You know, if it, if it looks like an input range, it is an input range. And this is actually a crucial point because this is how we get our performance out of it which I'll get to later. So here's an input range that reads from standard in. And I'm a little unhappy because it's a little more code than I think it ought to be. But we're working on that to try to simplify things. Um, but here are three properties which I highlighted in red. Empty. Um, if it already has a character in the one character buffer, it's not empty, otherwise it gets the next character. If the next character is end of file, it is empty. Otherwise, it puts the character in its little buffer and says, I'm not empty. All front does is returns the copy of our buffer. Pop front just says our buffer is empty. And here's our two little state variables. So there we go our first component or partial component. So let's read from standard in and write to standard out. So our for loop starts looking like this. Um, we get our input range, which is std in by care. And while it's not empty, and here's our basically our i++. We're advancing to the next one. Here we're getting, getting the character and writing it to standard out. Well, should be pretty straightforward. Yes, sir? I have a question about this uh, interface. Interface? It sounds like there's an implicit constraint that we have to call empty before you put the character. Uh, yeah. So what is that? Yes, that's correct. So how is that expressed in the interface? Like, how, uh, how can I, if I implement this interface, how can I make sure that the consumers are going to follow that interface and as a consumer, how can I make sure that if I break that, So that's a great question. The question is, how does the uh, input range be designed so it cannot be used incorrectly? And the way to do that is to put uh, asserts in the thing so that if you try calling uh, front before you've actually read any data, it will give an assertion failure, 
which means you're using it in an invalid way. Um, I didn't put a search in there mainly because it wouldn't fit on the slide if I did that. But if you're building a robust um, input range, you'd want to put checks in there. At least for your debug mode, you'd want to have those checks in there. Sure. Mm -hmm. How exactly are you going to express that? I mean, most of the constraints are going to be expressed by the language, right? You have the type system, for example. You have an interface, the interface is going to have some signature for some methods, and you know that that is how the interface looks. If you don't follow that signature, it's not what you expect. In this case, um, other than documenting that, okay, you have to call anything before you use prompt. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, some of that I will get into later. Uh, some of it I don't cover, which is uh, D has a feature called uh, contracts. Okay, contracts are part of the interface to a function or something like that, and the contracts are written by the programmer and enforced, then enforced by the compiler. So that's one way to do it. Another way is there are ways to do compile time checking of things which can cover part of this as well. So the combination of those two, I believe, if you are, are writing a professional quality component, you can, you can have that covered. You don't have to rely on what I call faith-based programming, <laughs> which means you're hoping the programmer uses it right. You can mechanically verify he's using it right. Eric. I believe that you, you can't go 100%. Like if you, the requirement for your algorithm is that it be order n, I don't know how to verify that at compile time or at runtime, except if it hangs or not. <laughs> um, but you can, you can go pretty far with it. Yes, sir. Right, I believe that's a C-sharp approach. Yes, sir. I think one of the benefits of component-oriented programming is that by reducing the number of interfaces that people have to know about, like in this case, if Walter can just get you to understand the interface input readiness, then you don't have to document that for everything that implements the concept. So part of the way you, you address it isn't by adding mechanical tools for, for doing it, by reducing the scope of the problem to three concepts in this case. I, I, I agree. Um, interface, I mean, an input range is not a type, it's a concept. And there aren't that many uh, concepts to programming, to component programming in D, so once you know the concepts, you know, it just, you sort of get used to it. Um, if you're writing a new component, you don't have to pedantically go over it all the time. So we have this with our for loop, and with a little comp language magic, we can automate a lot of that because the compiler looks for front and empty and pop front and puts that into for each. Now, an interesting thing about this is that there are no types in it. Uh, D has a nice 
a fairly extensive ability to infer what types of variables are from the context. So you, although you can explicitly put them, which is, has its place, you can also have the compiler infer them for you, which is very convenient. So now we're getting somewhere. So that basic input range is, you know, basic, and it works for a lot of things, but sometimes we want a little more. So we have another concept called a forward range, which adds another property, and that property is save. And what save does is it records a copy of the position you are in the range. Now, why? Why would you want to save a copy of where you are in the range? Um, being a compiler guy, how, where would you use this in a compiler? Yes, sir. Error messages. Error messages? I can't think of. Ah. Very good. You can uh, you can use it to back up to where you were before to print a reasonable error message about where you were before. But normally you'd use it to implement things like look ahead. You know, not all grammars are, you know, you know what you're going to do with the next token. Sometimes you have to look at arbitrary numbers of tokens ahead. So what you do is with the forward range is save a copy of where I am. Now I look forward, oh, you know, this is not that. It must be this. So then I can back up to my save position and then continue on. You know, the classic example of a forward range is a singly linked list. You can always save a copy where you are, move forward, and then move back. So that's all that is. Bidirectional range is, well, it's pretty obvious. It adds two properties, a back and a pop back, so you can go not only forwards, but you can go backwards through it. So a doubly linked list is the obvious example. The other not quite so obvious example are the Unicode encodings. You can go backwards in them as well as forward. Um, then there's, of course, the random access range. The canonical example is an array, and all you're adding there is an index, so I can pull out the nth item out of it, and it will have a property that either has the length property or it's an infinite range. An infinite range would be like, you know, a random number generator or something. It goes on forever. An infinite range is very simple. It's empty always yields false, and that can be detected at compile time. So at compile time, you can tell if something is an infinite range or not, which is kind of cool. Yes, sir? So do you have to return the same values when I'm traversing twice? Yes. How do you express the requirement? I don't know. <laughs> I didn't even think of that. Uh, generally, when you're traversing a range and trying to modify at the same time, you're kind of, that's not a very nice thing to do. <laughs> um, generally, I would not try doing that. Well, generally, if you make it const the compiler, you won't let you change it. Mm -hmm. So um, D has a very extensive ability for where you can have it mechanically verify that you're not allowed to change anything, and you use like const and immutable and things like that. So yeah, you can make ranges that are not modifiable. They're read-only. Yes, sir? Are these two different options? Are they actually different concepts, or is it one copy? There are two, they're two different options, two different ways to have a random access range. One is of infinite length, and the other one has a finite length. Would you express both of these in D as the same concept, or are you just describing options as you're describing your components? How, how, how do you? It's, Okay, you know it's an infinite forward range if empty always yields false, and that can be detected at compile time. Okay. So you can tell if it's an infinite range or not. Okay. Statically, at compile time. So, so Walter, um, a forward range can have an op index? Yes. Yes, 
it is required to be 01. Otherwise, it, it doesn't make much sense. Um, there are people who, and it sounds like a great idea, have a being able to index a, let's say, a singly linked list, okay, and treat it like an array. Um, this always ends in disaster because you wind up with these exponential behavior. It just doesn't, yeah, it just doesn't work. Uh, Brad. Okay, we're on the right page. Well, it means you can get the nth item out of it. So let's say you have a Fibonacci sequence. You want to get the nth. That's a good point. And I will, <laughs> I don't have an answer for you right now. You're right, I should have had an example up here of an infinite range that's indexable and I don't have one. So can anybody think of one? An infinite range with O1 access. Yeah. Yeah. Integers. Integers, there you go. There's integers are one, though that's kind of, kind of, yeah, I would say, you know, like squares. You could go to an open series as long as you have a separate expression that can compute that infinite series in L1. Right, like, of X. like squares or sine of X or something like that. Yeah. Um, well, it would kind of have to be a mechanical series if if it was an infinite range. I can't think of an example that wouldn't be. Yeah. It, 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 I don't know any way to compile or verify that, at, or at runtime verify it. Um, the idea being is that if you have an algorithm that depends on O1 access, it, the algorithm requires a random access range. Okay, so the reason to have this guarantee is so that your algorithms that use it can also have guarantees. Sinks. Sinks are nothing more than you have a member called put where you can put an element of type E into it. That's it. So let's create an output range that writes the standard out. And put, that's the only requirement. There's our character and calls good old C's F put C. One of the features of D is you can call C functions. And there's no J and I or marshalling or any of that nonsense. It calls it directly, uh, just like you would in C. So, and we're also checking for end of file, and if it fails, we throw an exception. So our earlier loop it was like this, using an output range. This becomes for each, reading characters from our input range, and we're putting them in our output range. And it even handles errors correctly. You know, look, there's no error handling code in there, but it still handles errors correctly, which is kind of cool. Kind of like having it by default, it's handling the errors correctly. It copies its input to its output, and we could call it copy. And we've got our first algorithm, copy takes by reference a source, uh, writes by reference uh, to a sync, and here's our implementation of it. And uh, well, it ain't perfect because it's very specific to these types. 
And if you want to have different types, you're going to have to copy paste a different piece of code. And you know we failed in our component design, so we need more. And the way we do it is we parameterize it. We parameterize it on these types. And so basically, this makes it into a template. Solves our generic problem. But it will actually accept any input type. You could pass it an int for your sync. An int is not a sync. So what happens when you try this is you get the, you know, the classic disaster of you know, horrible uh, compiler error messages that you have no idea where they came from or why they exist. And that's not really acceptable. So we want to add constraints. And this gets back to what this gentleman was talking about. This is our constraint. It's a piece of code that executes at compile time. And if that execution comes up as true, it says, OK, I can do it. And if it's false, then this template does not match. So we have in the standard library a template which can determine if its argument, this little bang means there's one argument to the template, is an input range. And, an, and if our second argument is an output range, and the element type of that output range is the same as the element type of our input range. Yes, sir. Well, actually, you can just use the and, 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 or, or. It all works fine. You can also put function calls in here and write really anything well, I, you want. I mean, after the block, can you have else to define an alternate definition in case uh, source is not an input range or sync is not an output range? Um, you can't do an else, but you can do an or, or. You can also do a function with the same signature in a different conditional. Yeah, you can also call functions in it. And in those functions, you have the full language available. Uh, D has the rather unusual characteristic of being able to run D code at compile time, as long as it can figure out what the arguments are. You're looking at me kind of blankly. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I got the answer, but let's go. So to clarify, the, the generated code from successfully instantiated template won't have the that's right. This is a compile time creature only. It, does, it has no effect at runtime. Even though compiler can actually run the instance of those guys, right? To verify they could do that, what did you ask them to do that? But after that verification is done, that code is gone. That's correct. It's, it's a pure compile time creature. David. That's correct. You can have multiple copies for different kinds of ranges, and you can use this if statement to select which one is actually selected. <laughs> and if more than one copy is selected by this, then you get a compile time error because it doesn't know which one you want, and you have to go back through and look at your constraints so only one is picked. But yes. So this opens up the possibility that you can have general algorithms and specific custom algorithms for a particular data type, which is one of the secrets to how you get in the you know, industrial quality code, is you can do custom or components with a generic interface, but for custom types. Yes, sir. Is there a preference for, I mean, if, assuming more than one of these if statements is true, is there a preference for the more specific Yes, it does a thing that's called partial ordering. Okay. Uh, how partial ordering works is uh, basically picking the most specialized match. And it actually uses the same algorithm that C++ uses for partial ordering. Um, C++ is interesting in that function overloading uses one set of criteria. Template overloading uses partial ordering. Uh, D actually uses partial ordering for both. Partial ordering is, I think, a, a much more understandable and a better way of doing function overloading. So that's, that's 
actually a fairly subtle difference between the two languages. Very few people ever run into the difference, but uh, it is a difference. So current status of our component is we have our source, our sync, and our copy algorithm, but we're really not there yet. Um, we need the universal function call syntax because what that is is nothing more than if I have a function which takes three arguments, I can write it like this. I can pull the function, the first argument out and put it in front with a dot. So our component now looks like source, copy, sync. In other words, it looks, we have our left to right flow, which is what we wanted from the beginning. So, what are some examples of uh, algorithms other than copy? Filter, we have an array of one, two, three, four, five, and we wanna filter based on this lambda function, which is the values that are less than three and we want to write out our result, and our result, it'll print one comma two. Map does something similar. It, we take our lambda and we replace our parameter with the square of the parameter, and it takes our array and one, four, nine, 16, 25. I got a quick question. Sure. Yes. You could actually could always do lambdas before, but the syntax was kind of wacky. Yeah. So what we did was uh, we did a survey of every language we could find that had lambda functions and wrote a list of what all the syntax, and then we all had a vote. <laughs> <laughs> this one was the winner. Everybody liked that one, and uh, it's it's funny what a difference just a little syntactic sugar makes, because all of a sudden, you know, the usage of lambdas exploded in D, just by changing the syntax of it. See, I was used to the old one, and it's more like a list one. Well, you know, <laughs> the, the user interface makes a difference. So what is the exclamation? What is the what? The exclamation mark. The exclamation mark is, uh, I wish I had a chalkboard here, but um, in C++, you put angle brackets around your argument. In D, if you have only one argument, you can just put a bang in front of it. Yeah, or you're gonna go bang, paren, arg, 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 paren. So the idea, so if you just went like that, does that make more sense? Are you used to C++ templates? Okay, well you know about the, okay. Imagine the bang paren is a less than sign, and then the closing paren is the greater than sign, and you have the equivalent. Well, now you can with C++ 11. Or can, can in C++11 you put a function as a template argument? You can't? Oh. Well, you can in D. <laughs> you, uh, what, what is the what? Map is a template, and the template takes an argument which is a lambda function a template argument or as a template argument, okay. and then the R here is a function argument. So it's a, a template function that takes both type arg that takes both compile time arguments and runtime arguments. Okay, so one template argument and one uh, parameter. That's correct. This is the compile time argument. This is the runtime argument, okay? A template function in D has two argument lists. One argument list is your usual runtime arguments that you have with a function. It has another argument list, which are the compile time parameters. That's kind of what makes it a template, is it has a compile time argument list. So you have two parameter lists. 
The stuff X or the exclamation point is the compile time parameters, also known as the template parameters. Okay, yes, sir. Okay, so the question is, is this inlined or is it called through a function pointer? Okay, um, that depends on how good your decompiler is. However, all the existing ones will inline it. You can pass a pointer to a function, in which case, well, the compiler can't inline a pointer to a function, it will call it indirectly. So, but you can pass a function pointer there, but normally people pass a uh, lambda function there, and that is passed. There are three kinds of ways to pass a parameter. There's by uh, value, by reference, and by name. Okay, this is a template parameter is passed by name. So it passes the name of, well, an internally generated name for that lambda function, so the compiler statically knows what function it is and can inline it. Okay, a macro processor passes arguments by name, as an, another example of arguments by name. C doesn't have, the C language, not the preprocessor, doesn't have pass by name. Okay, reducers will tend to accumulate uh, a sequence of values in the one value. Uh, this one just uh, pretty much sums the contents takes two arguments, returns the sum, and the sum of this is 15, which it will then print. Yes, sir? No, it actually passes the name. I wish I had a blackboard. Oh, I do have a blackboard there. Well, can you point the video that way? <laughs> Okay, lambda function, right? So what actually is this if we sort of blow it out into what it really is? And what it is is uh, this is an internally generated name. Okay, does that make sense? Pass by name. Okay, so this gets internally rewritten to be this. It's actually a template. It's parameterized on its argument type, and it's return value of that type too. Okay, so when we call, well, let's write it up high so everyone can see it. The compiler rewrites that to be Does that make sense? Okay. It's passing the name of this function to it. So now when inside that template when it calls it's just a function call like you would have in C it says, Oh, I can inline that. No problem. How's it look in D? It's rather complicated. <laughs> However, if you go to uh, std. That's the module it's in, and if you do a Google search on that, you can find it. And the source code is all on GitHub. So, and it downloads with the D package too. So all the source code is there, all the documentation is there. Yes, sir. In, in this example where uh, you, the lambda function takes two arguments and it sums everything, uh, is it generate, does the map call that recursively? That generate lambda function? Um, it calls, 
Okay, that's the reduce function, not the map function. And the reduce calls it once for each element of the input range. And accumulates its value. That's what reduce does. What if the range only has one value in it? It takes the first one that's in the result. Uh, there's a special case in there for that. And it just takes the first one. Eric. So uh, the name lambda refers to a template. Template function. Passing a template function, not a function. Right. To map. Yes. But map probably is expecting a type and not. No, it's expecting a name. Okay. Uh, okay, okay, okay. You know, in C++, okay. you have type functions. I mean, you have type parameters, yeah, I get it. Yeah. constant parameters, and template template parameters. Yeah. A template template parameter in C++ is a pass by name. Okay. And D is generalized, so you can have pass by name, which can pass anything by name rather than just a template name by name. In fact, I really was confused by template template parameters until I realized they were passed by name. Yes, sir. Um, reduce requires a non-empty input range, right? Yep. Okay. Is that its own concept, or could it be? It could be, yes. But reduce will actually check that probably at runtime, and throw an exception if it doesn't work. <coughs> so. Now, I've given this talk like three times before, and you guys are way ahead of the other crowd <laughs> in your questions. Best audience I've had for this. OK, let's put it together and see what it looks like. And what we're doing is from standard in, we're reading by line, and this little thing says we want to keep the slash in at the end of our lines. So we're reading by line, and there's supposed to be a dot there. Huh. I'm going to get a pen here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and there, yeah, I imagine that is black and is, is going to stay there, yes. Um, and because byline reuses its own input buffer for speed, which is a source of controversy of if it needs a separate concept for that or not, but it does, um, what we want to do is create a copy of our input lines because our input lines, otherwise the buffer gets reused all the time. Uh, we want to put it into an array. Why do we want to put it into an array? Because we need a random access range. So we feed our byline, you know, this is not a random access range, it's a, you know, it's an input range. And we want to feed it into an array, so we now have a container that gives us random access, and we call our lovely sort program, and then our copy algorithm, which writes to standard out. Who can guess what locking text writer does? Yes, sir. Close? OK, what happens in a C program when you write to standard out? And you have a multi-threaded C program? Oops. OK, well, what happens in C, if you look in the library routine, is each write to standard out actually locks the stream and then writes, and then it unlocks it. OK, what locking text writer does is it locks it once for this entire operation. So this entire operation, if you have a lot of threads writing in standard out, is going to come out together rather than interleaved with some other threads output. That's all that is. So it looks more complicated, but the complexity has to be there. If you took this thing out, you're going to get poor multi-threaded things. If you took some of this other stuff out, you're going to get poor performance. So. Yes? Is leaking a bunch of abstractions there. Am I? What, what's, which ones are leaky? Well, the, the fact that you need to know all this stuff about keeping terminators and reusing the, the bind buffer and the locking text writer. Yeah. 
Well, we're doing something that's not trivial here, and there's a lot of flexibility here. There's a lot of flexibility here, but I would argue that that's not leaky. Leaky means that you know my sort is depending on standard n somehow. That would be a leaky abstraction. That's not happening here. So, I disagree. The map, the map is weird. The map is weird. Why is the map weird? Um, that's that's true. Remember, I said there was a controversy about here. Uh, the problem is, is if you have standard in byline allocate a new line for every line it reads from standard input. If you're reading a million lines of text, and there are applications that read a million lines of text, it becomes agonizingly slow. So the optimization there is to reuse the buffer for every line, and that gets the performance up, but it does add a little complexity, and you do need to know what you're doing with it, but the component interface is still maintained. You can swap this with other generators and get a, a sorted output of them. So the, the component part of it, if it works. That's true. And uh, the benchmarks we've run on this, I don't like showing benchmarks because everyone says that, you know, I'm biased or I cheated or whatever. But you, I encourage you to run them yourself. This is as fast as you could write in hand, handwritten code. And it blows away other, other languages doing the same thing. And I challenge you to try it with other languages, uh, you know, a straight up comparison. Mm -hmm. What's the nice, straightforward way to control boundary situations when you combine basically one line so many components together? Each of them can fail individually. In um, are you talking about simply running out of memory type failures or any other kind Just of failures? Um, no, I, I think it, running out of memory is a special kind of failure as opposed to like running out of disk space? For example. OK. So my, my basic question is, every time when we combine something into the pipeline, and each component of the pipeline can fail in many different ways, what is the natural way to control and preserve the consistency of the whole pipeline? OK, I have two words, exception handling. Okay, exception, uh, D has a number of mechanisms which enable you to write what's called exception safe code. And if you write your components in an exception safe manner, which is a whole nother uh, presentation, um, it, it works. And you can write code like this. I challenge anyone to write this kind of code with error codes. I don't even know how to do it. Okay, so I'm not, I'm definitely not in the uh, error code camp because I like writing stuff like this. I like the fact that it detects that it's not ignoring the errors. The errors are all detected by each individual component, and it throws an exception when it gets the error, and it's it's not gonna um, it's not gonna pretend to work. Okay, I've I've used C for a long time, and even on you know well-developed operating systems that are written, if they're written in C, try getting close to your disk being full, and then run various Linux utilities. They all start behaving really weirdly because nobody bothers to check for out of memory errors or disk full errors. They just go, oh, printf, yeah. Um, how many times have you seen printf and check the error code on it? On it? <laughs> nobody checks the error code on printf. They just assume it works. So, you know, indeed that's, that's you know, you get an actual exception thrown when your disk is full and it doesn't pretend to work or behave erratically. Yes, sir? Exceptions can be a form of leaky abstraction if they're not documented as part of the interface. Is it common practice in the for concepts to document what failure modes they throw and which exception they associate with? 
Um, I disagree with your premise, so I disagree with your requirement. <laughs> okay, the reason I disagree, I think it is basically impossible to document what exceptions a particular component can throw. And the reason is, is because a component can be compo calling other components which it doesn't know about. Right. So that's why it's a leaky abstraction. I don't agree that that's leaky. Because it's coupled to the implementation. You can't look at the component and know how it's going to behave unless you know how it's implemented. You, you know that it may throw an exception. That's all you need to know. You don't, you don't, if you started hard coding in there different types of exceptions, yes, now your abstraction has become leaky. But if you just put generic exception handling code saying, if this component is exiting by an exception, I don't care what that exception is. I just know I got to clean up my stuff and then pass the exception on up the chain and hope somebody else can handle it. That's not leaky. No, they don't. Okay, I'm, I'm going to disagree, but I'd also say that all exceptions have a, a, a way to attach a message to it. So at least at your top thing, you have a message of what went wrong and you print that for the user. Saying, you know, disk full or couldn't find file XYZ or um, you, had an inner, you had some overflow somewhere or something else failed. So you do have a message. Um, what you do about it. If, if it's bubbled up that far, there's not much you can do about it at that point except print the message and exit anyway. Um, yes, sir? How do you debug it when each component has an issue? How do you debug that this particular one? That's what the challenge I face in C sharp also when you have dot, dot, dot. Which component actually has the problem now? If it throws an exception? Uh, the same way you would debug a program with a bunch of function calls strung together. You just set a breakpoint inside the component and see if it's there. You could go inside a component just like you could go inside of a uh, function. Um, when the compiler inlines things, it, you know, the boundaries between the functions and the components get a little fuzzy. So sometimes to debug it, you might want to turn off uh, function inlining because then the, the boundaries become a little clearer and they don't get all mung together. Yes, Brad? The other choice for debugging there is it is a trivial pipeline of, of, of essentially a function call. Break it into two functions and, and inspect the data in the middle. You, know, you well, can break right after array and go, what's my array look like? And then throw it That's an excellent point. Right here in the middle, you can insert another algorithm that all it does is print what's coming through it. It then passes it along for example. So it's pretty much the classic uh, printf style debugging. You can add custom components that are solely for debugging purposes. Yes, I think that's an excellent point. One of the advantages of component programming is you can test the components individually and then they have a much higher chance of working together when you snap them together than if it was all custom code. So let's go over the language features we need to make this work in D, which are rather extensive. Um, we need exception handling for errors, which we talked about. Uh, generic functions, you know, basically templates. Uh, the template constraints, which in C++, they would, that would be called the concept. Uh, uniform function call syntax. Uh, we know ranges are type, concepts not types. Um, we talked about inlining, customization, and optimization, and specialization. Now, these two items are how you get the industrial quality code. Because as has been well demonstrated in C++, when you're using templates to specialize on certain types and do inlining, um, you can generate code that is as good as hand-built code to do the same thing. And this has been shown over and over and over 
to be true and to be successful in C plus, and it's equally successful in D. You can get industrial quality code. If you were doing component programming based on a pointer to a V table of methods, you're not going to get the performance out of it because you have too many function calls in there for all your operations. The idea to get the performance is you, you don't want to have pointers to functions, you don't want to have virtual function calls, you want to do everything directly and then let the compiler inline it and then optimize the heck out of it. Uh, specialization, um, that also doesn't work too well when you have uh, virtual functions. Specialization means you can make custom algorithms for custom data types and still conform to the component interface. Um, type deduction, we went over that. Uh, tuples we didn't go over. Um, tuples are basically uh, lists of types or lists of ranges or lists of values and you can write ranges to deal with all those as well. You can, um, this was mentioned before, how do you deal with disparate, combining disparate ranges? Well you make a tuple of them and you pass you create another input range that is iterates over the tuple of input ranges. It's all kind of kind of weird, but it does work. <laughs> I don't have any examples up here for it, but there are examples in the uh, STD algorithm documentation of doing just that. Conclusion: uh, I believe components are a way of making actual reusable code. Mm -hmm. And when I've been playing with this, it actually does seem to work. My components are reusable. Um, com pipeline components are a proven success story of making reusable components. It's a great success story. Uh, components are a combination of, of a convention and language support. You'll notice that the input ranges are known to the decompiler, so it can create for each loops around them. And lots of advanced features of D come together to uh, make this work. And that's it. So, more questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the question is, does a compiler itself fit the pipeline extraction? And I would say, yes, it does. Compiler goes through multiple stages internally. Um, it reads the file, it lexes the file, it parses the file, it runs a semantic analysis, it does function inlining, it does uh, you know, conversion to an intermediate form, it does optimization, it does code generation, it does some more optimization on the back, and then it writes to an object file. And those definitely fit the pipeline model, and in fact, I've toyed with this idea over and over and over again to set it up that way so that you could have different threads working on different parts of the pipeline. Yes, that yes, you can have a pipeline where an algorithm can write to two provide two input ranges as its output and you can connect two things to that. Yes, you can do that. There is an ex example of it. I don't have the syntax in my head at the moment, but there is an example on STD dog algorithm of doing that, of doing two things with the same input range. Uh, getting the sum of it and the average value of it, and it, bas it shows the basic idea. Okay, the T algorithm. Oh, more questions? Yes, sir.
The question is, how do you add more flow control over the basic uh, empty thing? Yes. So you want a loop rather than a line? Um, I think you're on your own with that. <laughs> that. That sort of violates the basic idea of having an assembly line, having, having it loop around back on itself. Add. My, my my initial thought on that is I would think real hard about trying a different design. <laughs> and that's just off the top of my head. Okay, you may be forced into that, but yeah, not everything is going to fit into this model. Ah. That in some cases, that the classic pipeline is a push pipeline, where where something is providing an input and it gets it gets it, it comes all the way to the output. But then there's the pull pipeline, which somebody establishes a need, and that need is propagated upstream, and the response is propagated back downstream. Okay, this is a pull setup. Ah. It is a pull setup. Okay, let me go back. This calls sort, says give me something, sort calls this, array calls that, blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. Now, the other universe, the bizarro inverse of this is the push universe. And, you know, Eric Myers has had a great tutorial on, on how that whole reverse of that is works in C sharp. It's a whole different way of doing things. Yes. The the last thing is actually pushing it into the locking text writer, but so the copy is the center of the whole thing. The copy is where the where the basic loop is in the hard implementation. Yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't. It isn't even called until sort calls it. That's what I meant. But that that's a, you know, a detail of how the component works. It doesn't have to work that way. But, you know, sort really needs all of its input before it can do anything. Um, but it doesn't start getting its input until copy asks it for the first element. Yeah, copy calls it. Okay. Yes, sir. It's also true that you can set up each of these algorithms as, as either lazy or eager, or even have them do it in parallel. Like you could have, uh, you know, some of these sort dot parallel, which is a parallel sort, or I mean a sort parallel. Um, there's nothing that says it has to be um, single threaded or anything. So there are a lot of ways you, you can you can design these components, but as long as they follow that component interface, the user doesn't really care. He can just, you know, pick from his list of which algorithm he wants to use. Eric. Uh, so one question and then a probable follow-up. Um, so what you're calling component-oriented design is uh, programming in ranges. Yes. Okay. So C++ has ranges, and uh, C++ 
plus has concepts in that you know the STL is is built around them. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so is, uh, you know, and in C++, this design methodology is called generic programming. Um, and that's what was used to design the SDL. So is, would you say, concurrent-oriented design is just kind of the subset of generic programming that deals with ranges? I think the STL is pretty much the same thing, except it uses iterators instead of ranges. Well, it doesn't compose as nicely. It, it doesn't compose as nicely, yeah. Um, the problem with iterators is you always need a pair of iterators rather than a single iterator, and a range is basically a pair of iterators. Yeah, if you. I'm not sure about C++11, but if you tried to write this in the C++ uh, 98, I don't think I think it would be difficult to get this far with it. Well, Boost actually has a range library that allows you to uh, actually with the Unix pipe syntax uh, chain a bunch of operations together, and they operate on Unix. Okay, has that? I don't know anything about that. So. Yes, sir. Does D have coroutines? Uh, no, it does not. D does not have coroutines. Does, does not have coroutines. Ah, yeah. Not as part of the language. You could probably, you know, gen up something that'll work. Um, I mean, it is a systems programming language. You can you can make it work, <laughs> but it's not a uh, it's it's not a specific feature of D. Did ha the runtime had what? Yes, and that's an having stack threads an example of you know using the system abilities to make it work. Um, but yeah, it, it doesn't have like a yield keyword, for example. So, more questions? Yes, sir. Right. Um, what, guarantees, what guarantees do you need on all the stages of the pipeline that you reason about how much of the process has been done on the half the data that's already been done? It's already been seen. I'm not sure I understand the purpose of the question. Um, if I was writing a component that I that may fail, but I don't want the thing to stop, I would have it uh, now say I'm empty when I've failed. Okay, and maybe pass a piece of data as the last piece of data that says you know I had an unexpected end to this. And Yeah. You know, that is a real issue when you're dealing with gigantic data sets. You know, you don't always want to start over from the beginning. <laughs> so, yeah, I think with some careful work of your components, you can make that, make that work and still fit the model. Yes. Um, yeah, there's an ongoing discussion in D on how to improve the uh, property feature in order to simplify things. Do you, do you have ideas of what that could look like? I mean, is your point of view? Um, 
Boy, there's a long discussion there. <laughs> well, I just, I'm just i curious because I saw a gigantic discussion of it. it was like, well, Andre and I have had some long conversations, and we're pretty much in agreement on a significantly simplified thing. And it doesn't satisfy everybody, but nobody's come up with an idea that satisfies everybody. And we kind of want to err on the side of having a, a simple, straightforward mechanism that may have may make some corner cases more complicated as opposed to a more complicated system even for the simple cases. If that makes any sense. Um, the other thing we're thinking of is uh, creating another input range type called a sentinel input range. And a sentinel input range terminates on reading a special uh, piece of input called a sentinel. The classic example of a sentinel terminated range would be a zero terminated string, where zero is your sentinel. Um, C, uh, C standard in, it ends with EOF. That's another example of a sentinel. Um, I think the standard in iterator would be a lot simpler if we did it in terms of a sentinel input range. So that's an ongoing uh, discussion. Um, it, it came up when we were trying to design a lexer using input ranges and found that really, to make the lexer really, really fast, it needs to be a sentinel termination rather than constantly checking to see if it's at the end of the uh, source. So that was kind of, kind of the big motivating uh, use case for it. So there's probably another input range we're going to have. Yeah. You mean the Sentinel input range? No, just the discussion of kind of how to do, well, I figured that kind of flowed into the whole idea of how the properties are defined. Um, there's a fair consensus going on and just somebody has to now go through the work of documenting it, implementing it, testing it. Um, the focus for the next version is to get the shared libraries working properly. That's kind of an overriding thing we've been putting it off too long and now we got to get it done <laughs> so yeah oh an enormous amounts happen it, it it's actually uh, kind of overwhelming how much has been happening just in the last few months with the it's really been taken off um, we've got a lot of uh, some some heavy hitting users of it now and uh, a lot more people are using it, which means a lot more people are coming up with ideas and proposals and uh, you know things that ought to be improved. And so there's an awful lot happening with it. Actually, a lot of fun. And just the crowd here, this is the biggest crowd we've ever had for a D conference at this NWCPP. I mean, that's another indication of what's happening with the language. Yes, sir. Um, the order is set by the order in which you went, you put the dots in there. If you want to pick a different order, just pick a different order. The idea with components is you can change the order that's composable. Yeah. Well, 
Well, as I said earlier, most algorithms you can make as lazy or eager, and that, that controls the order, or you can make them run in parallel. There are a lot of parallel algorithms. Um, but that's really uh, up to you as the component designer and or the person who selects what components to use. But the, the order in which things are applied is the order that you type them. That's the assembly line thing. <laughs> the compiler doesn't try to shuffle the order around for you. It's not, uh, it's not commutative, let me put it that way. Okay, I think I have an answer for you. Um, components, remember we talked about with copy, you can have special, different kinds of specializations for different kinds of input. Okay, you can have specializations for if a bidirectional range is available, you can have it pick that algorithm, and that algorithm may run faster on bidirectional ranges, and you can have another algorithm which is effective for use with uh, forward ranges. So you can detect at compile time whether it's a bidirectional range or a forward range, and pick an algorithm that at compile time, you can pick an implementation that matches your input data. <coughs> Okay. <laughs> Yes, and you can, uh, let's say, you know, some sort of matrix algorithm. It could be ser done serially or done in parallel, and you, the user could pick which one he wants. He could, have the matri he could pick the matrix parallel component or the matrix serial component and benchmark the two and pick whichever one is faster for his particular data. Um, there's, there's nothing about the component interface that says it must be serial or it must be parallel. I, I believe it allows you to do that. I believe that's correct, yes. So one, one more question. <laughs> no more? Okay, thank you.